God's presence, the person of Jesus that's married in the praises of his people. The psalmist said that God is inhabited. He, he becomes married to the praises of his people. He sets home. He comes close. He's here. And what we as believers must understand that our greatest asset and ally is the person and the presence of God. Because of one fact, the scripture says that God's presence melts mountains like wax. I would assume all of us today in this room feel life, fear, worry, concern. We feel the natural elements of this fallen world, sin and shame. But yet the Bible says that in God's presence, those mountains dissolve and melt like wax before the Lord. Here's my question today. If you can be honest and say, I need help today. I need a help that comes not from man or education, but I need a help that comes from the Lord. Would you lift your hands high in this place this morning and all over at home? Because his presence is so great and his presence is so strong. And because in his presence is the fullness of joy. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voice and magnify the Lord. So good. So great. So strong. So awesome. So faithful. So kind. So mighty. So strong. So eternal, so immortal, so worthy, so worthy, so worthy, so worthy. So church, we're you beloved bride. Oh, how he loves his bride. He's not ashamed of his bride. He loves, he defends her, he protects her. He will build his church in the gates of hell. They'll knock and they'll come, but they will not prevail. This is our strength. He is our strength. He's our present help. And I'm more convinced of that now than ever. It was the other day, I, I try to read the Psalms a day. I've told you for years, it keeps the devil away. I'm just telling you, you find stuff in Psalms that's real and transparent, but it shows the, deity, the DNA and the nature and the glory of God. In Psalm 70, verse 4, I'm going to ask for your participation today because worship is continual. But this is what it says. It says, but may all who seek you. So if you're a seeker, if you're here today, here's your response. Just the fact that you're seeking, just the fact that you're inquiring, we should be the most hysterically happy. Thing. Just the fact that I'm aware of them. I'm seeking them. Just the fact that I'm here right now prioritizing his preeminence. Don't have all the answers, don't have, no, but I'm seeking, I'm inquiring. Be glad in you and listen, here's our posture, here's our stance. And may those who long for your salvation, here it is, always say, the Lord. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna do something, just a moment. We're gonna shout so loud that walls are gonna fall. Okay, the, the, we're going to shout so loud that the, that the, the foundation may shake a little bit. Because we're going to declare, not what I see, not what I feel, not what's around me. We're going to declare the Lord is great for your home, for your family, over your body, over California, over the nation. We're going to declare it. Are we ready today to lift your voice and to declare from the front to the back, the left to the right. Lift your hands high to heaven. Say, Father, I cherish your presence. So honored to be here today. My response and my declaration over every circumstance is this truth. The Lord is great. You got it? 
Now come on, just for a minute, JJ, let's worship him. Let's declare his goodness. This section, on the count of three, just say, the Lord is great. One, two, three. All of you at home on that camera in this middle section that's strong, on the count of three, say it. One, two, three. Not last but not least, on my left, your right, from the front to the back. One, two, three. Yeah! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ah, so good to be here. So good to see you. I feel like it's our first time. You look, you look great this morning. If you could see my heart, you would see humility, thankfulness, and faith just to be here. Humbleness to stand before you. Thankfulness that we're here together and a faith that God can do anything and everything, and he's here today to touch and change lives. Yes. Are you ready? Amen. Before you're seated, just look to somebody and say, say, the Lord is great. The Lord is so great. Ah, to God be the glory. Wow. Sometimes I think we should make these more regular, like Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. It's beautiful. Yeah, that was outstanding today, you guys. Thank you. Y Yolanda, you already left, but Yolanda, you're a major blessing. I was watching you and your family, all 25 of you today. I'm just like, what a great family. I love you guys. Proud of you. Thank you, guys. So good. So blessed. So happy to see you today. We're adjusting a little bit of the flow of service and things like that and want to just let our time together just be uh, really saturated and focused and intentional and in worshiping the Word and just allowing the Spirit of God to move in a powerful way. Amen. I've been doing this a, a long time by His grace, but I've just become more desperate, more needed now than ever. And um, I think we all have a sense of that. It's kind of a cool moment and if you'll allow me to share it with you because each of you are so much a part of what we're doing here vital part of what we're doing here. Each of you are an answer to prayer. Uh, God always blesses on both ends, and uh, he, that's just how he does it. So if you've been blessed, then you're in return a blessing. But um, tomorrow, it's October 19th, and that may not mean much to you unless it's your birthday or anniversary, but it means a whole lot to us because 12 years ago, tomorrow, we had our first service. Yeah. Yeah. We were off Clinton Keith at Tovashaw Elementary School. We had 16 people walk the aisle and give their life to Jesus. And uh, I've told the Lord here recently that <clears throat> because we're all still standing, which we are, which is powerful, having done all just to stand, just the grit. <laughs> Just the grit to keep standing and keep smiling in the midst of whatever is going on. But I realize that the only fact that we can stand is because he's strong. So to God be the glory. For every moment, every season, and every day. And that we're here standing and endeavoring to get better and to grow in faith and to move forward in that. And you're all a part of that story. And that's a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. 
next week we have what's called our Vision Sunday, and we'll maybe do some more reminiscing and talking about that, but we'll also build vision for, for where we're going and for what we're doing. But, honey, would you come up here for just a minute just to say hello to the people? And we were talking the other night about those 12 years, huh? What, what were the age of the kids? Brooke was one. Um, Hope was three. Then Caleb was five, and Tom was ten. Gosh, wow. babies, all little. Now they're all big. It's been twelve years, huh? <laughs> what, do we have? What, 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 what do you Incredible. think about that, or what are the thoughts about that, or? Um, do you remember that first service? Yeah, that was. We were so expectant and setting up those chairs. We would set up, yeah. tear down. On Saturdays, we remember? In elementary school, but praying, believing God for amazing things. Yeah. Um, I love looking back and knowing that our intention, our hearts, our excitement, our expectation hasn't dwindled mm. in 12 years. Mm. We still are, you know, I always think like, gosh, 12 downs, years down the road, how are we going to be? How's our marriage going to be? How's our kids going to be? How's our church going to be? You know, yeah. you hear all these stories of things that have fallen apart over the years, but God's been so faithful. He has been. We're strong. Our marriage is strong. Our family's strong. Our Praise church is God. strong. You, We're Lord. still loving Jesus. Yeah. I love that it hasn't changed us, but it's only gotten us closer to him. It's only become more and more clear that we're doing a mighty work and that we yeah. love, love, love all of you. We couldn't have done it yeah. for those, those that are with us, those that have left. Yeah. But this journey has been magnificent because of the people that have been with us. So 12 is significant. <laughs> there was 12 tribes, 12 disciples. 12, there's a lot of significance to 12. You were telling me as you were reading last night and praying that Jesus brought back 12 baskets full. Yes, after the miracle of 5,000. And, and you, you would think like we could stand at this stage and like know it all and have it all clear. And someone was asking me yesterday, you know, you just must have no issues reading the Bible and remember us. You know, sometimes you get this false impression like I'm as human as you are. I mean, there's a grace <laughs> and a gift, but like you would think that we just would have it all fixed out in a five-year plan, ten-year plan. And you wouldn't know how real and raw and faith this is. Um, and I don't all know what the future looks like. Sure. I know that we're committed to Jesus. I know that we want to make a difference. I know that we're cry, crying out for the nations and for something greater. But either way, we're here. And I just sense God wants to do something real great. Amen. So can we just for a moment before we get into the Word, just build a little altar bay for 12 years, thanking Him for that, and then just praying over the body and inquiring of the Lord of whatever He wants to do. Look no further. Here we are. Can we do that, church? Just honor the Lord. Can we honor His goodness, his grace, his faithfulness. There were some people in this room that were still with us. That's to me one of the greatest miracles of all yeah. is there's many people. Cornell Harvey may be watching this. People, people, my mother and father, the Totopetes, and I want to start naming names. So there's people that have been with yeah. us for 12 solid years. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Yes. Would you pray love and lead us? Father, we love you. All we can do is come to you with a grateful heart, a thankful heart. Mm heart that's always in pursuit of the race and, the, and mm. the prize that is you. Jesus, as we are embarking on this monumental moment of 12 years, mm. we undoubtedly give all the credit to you and who you are. Father, I thank you that it's been so good for 12 years and we could sit here and just uh. be content with all you've done, be so grateful and thankful, but Father, something inside us, I, I know it's you is saying there's more. There's more dreams to dream. There's more services, more people to touch. Father, more things to do in your name. Father, like Pastor always says, we're only getting started. And I just thank you, Lord, for these next 12 years. I thank you, Father, that you exponentially just do something so great that all will say it's you. That, Father, we will build an altar not of our faces or our names, but, Father, all the reflection is seen is how good Jesus is, how the victory comes from him, how we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, that all they see is you and we just pray father we thank you father through 12 years of laying seed wow. we call a harvest forth we thank you lord that you save the best for last and we know you're coming soon so we just pray for a harvest a harvest of souls a harvest of miracles
miracles, a harvest of young and old and all in between, a harvest, Father, to bring them into your presence. We pray, Father, for the missing pieces in our body, Mm. for the missing people that should be here. And we just pray, God, that the Way Family Church will be a whole body working as one, adding to the ministry daily. So we call up the gifts in this room. We call out the gifts over the camera screen. We call out the gifts and the people that need to come here. Father, because we're ready. We're ready to run, and we're going to run to win. And we thank you for your endurance, your faith, and your victory in jesus name thank you lord hallelujah can can we just not but just but however just honor the lord and thank him thank you lord thank Thank you lord thank you lord hallelujah thank you lord to god be the glory thank you for who you are your giving finances god can do so much with so little yes We couldn't do what we do without you loving Jesus and honoring his word and bringing your finances to the storehouse that there may be food here to feed his people. And we do this together. This conversation will continue next Sunday is our Vision Sunday. And it's a, I don't, is it a secret? Can I tell them or no? Yeah? Well, I'm going to tell you, yeah, it's too late. Listen, if you have a secret, we've been waiting 12, we've been waiting 12, we've been... (laughs) We, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't tell me. I'm a blabbermouth. <laughs> no, I'm not a tail bear. I'm <laughs> we have some, finally, after all these years, all of our merchandise of the way is going to be here next week. So Yay. we got hats and sweaters and all. It's going to be really cool. Very cool. So that'll be fun. And we got a lot to celebrate. Yes. I love you. I love you. Thankful for you. Yes. She's, I just love to have her pray. I like they pray. Like I almost should pay her to pray. It's like pay, pray, pay, pay. I love you. Hey, one more thing before we get in the word today, and I'm really excited about it. Um, yesterday, um, a real special man who we've known for many, many years went to heaven, and this man carries the attributes, the characteristics that inspire and strengthen and build. He was a father of four. He was as faithful as the day is long, and he was a man of faith. In fact, the last couple months, him and his wonderful wife were here, a part of our church, and about three or four weeks ago, I stood right here and talked to him for about 20 minutes. And he goes, I'm not here to flatter you, but I'm gonna tell you, that was one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. I said, don't you tell me if you don't mean it. We talked, and he just reminisced about all that God is doing. And many didn't know, but he was battling and fighting a fight. But no doubt he won because he ran his race. And he leaves a mighty legacy. And his precious daughter is as vital of this church as anybody. And this morning, Christina, I want to honor you. And we want to honor your dad, Joe Denary, and celebrate his life and thank him for his life. And we just have a bouquet of flowers, just a little token to tell you, We send our love, we send our condolences to you. Your dad was a powerful man. And as you text last night, there's a new angel (laughs) leading us, a new heavenly host looking over the balcony of heaven, cheering us on. What an honor to know him. And there's so much more to do. In fact, uh, if it's okay, you just turned... 34 years old, and uh, on that Wednesday night, you got baptized, and he was FaceTime in the hospital watching you get water baptized here, and amazing things. So what an amazing man he was, so friend, and so powerful. Can we pray over the Denary family, and can we honor, I don't think your mom's here today and your friends, but Father, we thank you for the Denary family. Loss is not easy because we're human, and we walk this life out, and we don't always see eternity as you see it. But Lord, you are the God of comfort and of peace and of strength. And we just pray now a covering of strength and of grace over this family, 
over Angela, over Nick, over Joe, over Christine, over the grandchildren, that, Father, you would come and be so demonstrative and powerful in this season, that this seed would multiply, that this family would be healed and stronger than ever, that they would run and not grow weary. And we thank you for the life of Joe, the gift, the impact he had, the life he lived, the living epistle he was, Lord. We hold this family with honor. And we now all commit them to you and trust you beyond our understanding. We thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tony. So thankful for you too. Everybody tell Alec you got a great looking haircut. You look good today, my man. Come here, Alec, real quick. Come here. Come here, Alec. Your mom said he's so handsome. <laughs> mijo, mijo, so handsome. I'm going to believe this year that you're going to fall in love. And, and you know what? God's going to bring her here. And you're going to have a great testimony. And you're going to say that when you follow and serve Jesus... He provides everything you need, want, and desire. You believe it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So look at the camera real big. He's right here. Here he is. There he is. He's strong in the Lord. Powerful. He's got abs. How old are you, Alec? How old are you? 22. So if you're up between 40 and 22. <laughs> Abby's older than me. It, it works. I never let her know that, but she's older than me. Sometimes the kids try to remind me, Dad, you're younger. I said, yeah, but I'm stronger. <laughs> Wasn't worship fantastic? Yes. Right now we've got the real heroes of the house teaching all of our children. Yes. And they're the real heroes. So thank you for serving the Lord in our children's ministry. Here's a plan. I've got a two-week plan, and that's pretty good for me. That's a big deal. <laughs> um, I'm going to conclude. This is week 14 of Jesus Teaches. I'm going to, in essence, conclude it because we're never going to stop the teaching of Jesus. But in essence, I'm going to conclude with this message. Next week will be Vision Sunday. And then I have awaited all year because in January the Lord spoke to me about this. I'm going to start a new series entitled Vessels of Honor. And I'm going to teach on purity sexual immorality, and how to get the sin out of our lives, and how important it is to be vessels of honor, not of dishonor, vessels of gold. So it's not going to be for, it's not surface, we're going to go really deep into walking in complete freedom, and I'm not going to stop until you have absolute freedom in your life, because it is for freedom that Christ set you free, and I'm going to believe that no matter what your past looks like, we're going to get ourselves so clean and healthy and strong vessels of honor. Amen? Amen. So that will be the plan. Does that sound good? Yes. You happy? Yes. All right. I want to teach today, and I said this for 13 weeks solid on the most important message yet. <laughs> Help me, Crystal. I'm so glad you're here, Crystal. Of um, Jesus teaches. I want to teach today on uh, how important and vital your perspective is and how perspective is the key to everything about your life. Perspective. So if you're writing notes today, put perspective is key or perspective is everything. I want to look at Matthew chapter 6, a couple verses here, and then Luke chapter 11 because they say the same thing but have a little different variations to it that we can glean from. And I think it will be very helpful to you today. I feel good. I feel safe. I feel happy. I feel thankful. And um, it's a good thing. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, and then Luke chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. Jesus speaking, he teaches this, so important. The lamp of the body is the eye. If, that's a big if, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And then just to support it and underscore Luke 11, same text, same flow, just a little bit of a different variation. How many know like all of you in the room, you would get a little different variation of the message. That's how the gospels are. God let them have their unique perspectives through their unique personalities. So Luke gets a little bit to deeper ways and says it in a cool way. Luke 11, 33 through 34, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come to it may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, I like this, when, not if, but when, When your eye is good, when your eye is good, everything else will go good. But if it's not good, nothing is right. Perspective is everything. Father, we honor your word. It's my endeavor to be a man who speaks your word with authority, with clarity. It's my endeavor that you would speak through me and by me. Would you amplify your word, and would you grant us the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of you, in Jesus' name. And Lord, it's my honor. Thank you for allowing me to love you. Perspective is everything because it impacts and it affects everything about my world and your world. How I see it is how I'll treat it. How I, how you see it, is how you'll treat it. Marriage, church, your walk with God, however you perceive it, is how you'll treat it. If it doesn't matter to you, that'll probably be the effort you give to it. And how you view it is how you'll use it. So my perspective and my perception, how I perceive, how I interpret, and how I filter life, how I filter it, my filter, my perception, my filter, listen, will always determine the course of my direction and my destination. I will end up with how I filter life. My perception, my perspective, how I filter, how I interpret life will determine my course of direction and the ultimate place of my destination. I am where I am based upon my vision and my interpretation of it. I've always said that in life there's three perspectives. No doubt. There's my perspective. I, Matthew, Gregory, Pollock have a perspective. And there's also your perspective. You have a valid perspective. And most people find a log jam. They're stuck because they have their perspective and the other has the other perspective and they don't meet together. They're as far as the east is from the west. But there's also God's perspective and the only perfect perspective is how God sees it and what God says about it because his perspective is good, is eternal, and it's from the end to the beginning. And the quicker we can get out of our stubborn, our skewed perspectives and get into God's vantage point through the renewing of our mind and the word, the better all of us will be. It's yours, theirs, and his. I see it my way, you see it your way, but God sees it the right way. The perfect way. Because he holds the eternal perspective. Scripture has so much to say regarding these things. I love what Paul said in Philippians 4, and it's important just to hear it on a repeat. Repetitive thing. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's anything virtuous or anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate. Think about. Think about. Consider. Talk about it. Think on these things. Because Paul knows our tendency is to go to the bad things. 
Does anybody else have a proclivity to go to what's not and what's missing? Does anybody else feel the enemy comes and hits them with everything that's not good, not praiseworthy, and we find this attack of the enemy, this bombarding of the enemy that says what could be, where I should be, if he was with me, why is this happening? And Paul says your perspective must be disciplined onto what is good, what is pure, who is here, what is he doing? How has he made a way? What's good? Talk about it. Celebrate it. Text it. Tell somebody. Sometimes we can all spend our relationships and everything about our life nitpicking on what's not. And all we're doing is feeding on the liar of the enemy who is bombarding our mind to steal our eyesight and our perspective to miss God in the moment. Robbed of joy. Minimized of fulfillment. Worried and perplexed and full of anxiety because our perspective is on all the wrong things. How you see it. How you see it. Whatever construct that is is ultimately will become the words you say and the path you take. I've said this for years, and I want to say it again, and I may amplify it because it's as relevant and powerful today as it was when the Holy Spirit gave it to me. Hear me. I mean, think about 2020. I mean, what if anyone hasn't felt loss, perplexity, some sense of like abnormalness to it. What's the same? The variations of it all? A, a, a sense of bewilderness, a sense of like emotional turmoil? I, I had a phone call just the other day from one of Southern California's heroic pastors, just kind of conveying, saying, oh, I just feel a sense of anger. Like, look what the enemy's done. And I, I mean, just things that just, that, that things have just not gone as they're supposed to go. But here's the key. Here's the key. Life, 2020, 2030, 1980, all of life is way more about what is than what's not. And if your focus this year is what's not, what was lost, who's not here, what you've missed, you will live in misery. But our perspective isn't what's lost, it's what's left. Come on. Our perspective must be, it's not about what isn't, it's about what is. Because what is is way more powerful. It's more about what is happening. Come on. we got to get fixed on what is, what is. I promise you, your marriage has more of what is and what's not. I promise you, there's more to live for than not. I promise you, there's more that is than not. And if we don't get this straight, every year we'll be miserable. Because the enemy will bombard us and attach us to everything that's not. Say that with me. It's always more about what is than what's not. And if you're looking for perfect, you'll never find it because there's only one. Colossians, if you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind. Get the right perspective. Get the right viewpoint. Get the right vantage point. Set your mind on things above. Perception, perspective, vision. Get a kingdom mindset. Don't stay here. For you died with him and now you're risen with him. Today's war on this generation, on every pastor, every believer, on all categories of life, today's war is a war of your attention and awareness. We are living in the hour of weapons of mass distraction and the enemy is taking us from being present. We're not present. We are consumed with everything else. The key to this hour is to be present and have my perspective and attention here and now. And the war the enemy has waged is to distract us with weapons of mass 
destruction. Amen. All three of you. It's encouraging. Are you present? No. No. Are you present? Are you aware? Do you see your surroundings? Are you aware of him? Are you discerning your thoughts? Are you casting down? No. Are you casting down the wrong? Are you aware of the enemy? No, no. Are you here? I know you're here physically. Are you here spiritually? Does he have your attention when you pray? Do you retain what you're reading? Is there, because the enemy's objective is just go through the motions, church. So the church is going through an exercise that we just know how to say praise the Lord. We just know that the Christianese and the flow, but are we in the moment of what's taking place, aware of conversations, discerning the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, open and aware? Are we present at the dinner table? Are we involved in the things around us, or have we put our emotions and entrenched them into distractions because we don't want to deal with the present thing I don't want to face or question or have to deal with? So it's better to be distracted because I don't want to have to have that conversation. I don't want to have to face me or face it. But until you face it and see it, you'll never change it. Are you present? We've been told in the church world because attention is, is so lost, you cannot preach more than 30 minutes because the attention of the people. But I know people who could watch a two-hour, 30-minute movie and have no problem. It's, no, no. So you don't have the time? No, wrong. The enemy's got you overloaded with the wrong. You got to clean your disc. You got to, you got to, you got to, come on, you got to remove the trash. You've got so much. You've got so much garbage. You got the wrong hard drive. So you can't have the attention you need to hear what you need because you're bombarded. Looking elsewhere, the butterfly. We're out just chasing every wind of doctrine. Every wind of looks good. That feels good to me. That makes me feel good. I don't know, what do you do with that? How do we get our attention back to our homes and to our families and the word and what God's saying? Think about these things. How do you respond to adversity? We've all had it. Adversity comes in all different forms of sizes. Do do you think we've had this church for 12 years and had a red carpet ride? I can't remember one season without adversity. Like I think at some point, oh, we get to 10 years, man, cruise. (laughs) It's like the enemy just turned up the heat. (laughs) All I realized, I just grew stronger. He didn't stop. I just got stronger. I just got better. I just... I keep waiting for there to be no discouragement. I keep waiting for there just to be, uh, 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 for, the, for, the, for the million, just to, just to pull. I just keep waiting for the barrels of money just to come and say, Pastor, do what's all in your heart. I just keep waiting. No, no. It, it, it's not that there won't be adversity. It's my perspective in the adversity and how I respond to the adversity that it, how do you respond to challenge, difficulty, hardship, loss, pain? Anyone lost anything, any kind of pain? How do you respond to opportunity, blessing, and favor? One's perspective will determine your destination. I love this. First Samuel chapter 16. Right as Samuel is going to anoint the new king David, he has the oil. The Bible points out David's characteristics and qualities. You know what it says about him, Arthur? It says that David had bright eyes. The first thing God highlights about David is he had a perspective that was positive. 
He, he had the right eyes. He was expectant. He was faithful. He saw things the right way. His eyesight was bright. What's the, what's the temperature? What's the, how is your eyesight? Is it dim? Is it dark? Or is it I want to be a bright-eyed, today's the day. I want to look at life with hope, expectation, faith, opportunity. And if you're not careful, your eyesight can get dim and down. You should be looking up, and you're looking down. Look up. Your help comes from the Lord. Look up and see. But if we're not careful, our eyesight looks with such depression and such gloom. This world is trying to pluck out your eyesight and take away the vibrancy to see life. What's your, I want bright eyes. Oh my gosh, we worship today. Oh my gosh, I get to read his word today. Oh my gosh, another day of opportunity. David was eager, let me at him. He had an eyesight. How do you look at your spouse? How do you look at challenge? How do you look at church? How do you look at your pastor? How do you look at 12 years? You could be, oh, you mourn, oh, we're gonna change our, wow. If that was, if that was 12, what would we be at 15? <laughs> it's all how you see it is how you treat it. I want bright eyes. It's funny because God points out David's bright eyes. And then the Bible points out all that David had to walk through for just a moment. Psalms 119, uh, 67. David, after nearly 20 years of affliction, running for his, from his, from, for his life from Saul, in cave to cave, being abused, mistreated, lied to. David... David, after getting the short end of every stick, anointed, but living in different caves, said, before I was afflicted, I wouldn't went astray. But now I keep your word. You know what David said? You would have checked out because the season was tough. You would have quit. You would have given up. I needed 20 years of affliction. I needed to wait. I needed, to try. I needed Saul to work Saul out of me. David said in the midst of whatever I'm going through, it's all good because God is good and he does good. And I don't care where I find myself in the midst of it. I can trust God's sovereignty in it. I'd rather be in a cave with God than in a palace without him. Can you say that? Can you say your hardest moment was for your good? Can you say when your heart was broken and you were most crushed, you needed it? That's the perspective we need in this hour to say my worst day was God's greatest moment of my life because I wouldn't have found him. If I didn't hit rock bottom, I wouldn't have changed. Before I was afflicted, God knows I would have went astray. The blessing would have killed me. If I would have got fame too quick, if I would have walked in this anointing without the character, it would have killed me. And so you can trust God right now. You lost the job or you haven't got the pray raise yet or you still feel like you're alone or friends are leaving you. You can have confidence with the right bright eyes. Oh my goodness, God is at work. And if he took Abraham 25 years and David 20 years and everybody else, I can wait to knowing God is at work. And he's, you know where God develops giant Killers in caves, secret moments of hardship, pain, misery. That's where kings come. That's where anointings come to change nation. That in obscurity, that when no one sees you, when you're overlooked and you're working things out, that's where God raises up powerful men and women. But what we do is we're victims of it. And if I was raised differently and if I had that, there's nothing but a more lie of the enemy. It's the wrong perspective. Psalms 11971. It was, maybe we should just pull this up for the for the for the help. You read it with me. No, stop. Stop. Hey, Pastor, I just lost my job, lost the house, and we're going to foreclosure. <laughs> oh, geez. I lost a lot. Wow. He said, 
It was good for me to go through that season that I may learn God. I would rather learn about God and get a revelation of God. And you know when you get the best revelations of God in hard times? You, you think me being perfect to you will help you with God. No. Sometimes man failing you will be the greatest time you realize he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And my faith isn't in man. It's in him. And sometimes man has to fail to show you the beauty and the wonder of our chief cornerstone of who God is. And sometimes man can't provide, so you see who is your provider. And you see that doctors can't do it, so you see who is your healer. And you see, come on, sometimes life has to get fickle and crazy and hard to show you that your Redeemer lives. Your Redeemer Come on, give him a praise today. Our Redeemer lives. What's your perspective? How many people quit, give up? Because of perspective. Psalms 18, David said, I was chastened severely. He said that. God whipped my behind a lot. You know what? We're in a day of blessing, but I'm telling you, and I feel this, the Holy Spirit is correcting his church. Because you know what? Me included, there's been a lot of things we've done that need to be corrected. And God corrects those he loves, and if we're not, we're bastard children. And I need correction. Life is 10% what happens to me, 90% how I respond to it. So God asked Jeremiah, the prophet, a big question. Hey, Jeremiah, what do you see? What do you see? And I'm going to ask you right now. It's October 18th, 2020. From my wife to Abby, to Josh, to all those at the camera, here's my question. What do you see? What do you see? Hey, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see an almond tree. And the Lord said, you've seen well. Now I can perform my word. I believe until we get the right perspective, we'll never see the right performance and manifestation of God's word. What do you see? What do you see? How do you see it? I see opportunity. I see a harvest. You know that God asked Jeremiah that twice? So here's Jesus. Just gets done uh, talking about the Beatitudes and his beautiful teaching, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The classic, the Mount Rushmore. The bookends of his teaching. And then Jesus stands up and says this, hey, if your eye is good, everything is good. If your eye is bad, everything's bad. The life you're living is based upon how you see it. Wow. If your eye is good. So I ask you today, Is your eye perspective good? Your whole body will be full of light. You'll talk right, you'll walk, your your steps will follow. Everything will follow in that chain. But if if your eye is bad, everything's negative. Everything's off. Everything's wrong. Let's sit down, son. I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. You know that. I'm just trying to be funny. The lamp of the body, the lamp of the body is your eyes. The eyes are the windows into your life. If your eyes good, everything else would be good, but if your eyes bad. Now, now, I must make this very clear. Because you're thinking, certainly, this is my natural, physical eye color. But, but friends, this has nothing to do with your 2020 vision. So I realized something that if you can read, up up on our screen, if you can read line eight, you got, if you can get five out of eight, you have 20-20 vision. Um, Ivan, would you be my guest today? Ivan, today we're going to take an eye exam and check out your vision to see where you're at. Ivan, if you can read five on line eight, you have 20-20 vision. Ready, set, go. I need you to be louder, Ivan. You got eight out of eight, my man. The, the last thing God's talking about is your eye vision. 
This has nothing to do with your examination on the quality of your eyes or if you wear glasses or contacts. This has nothing to do with your natural eyesight. Have, have an idea. Does she, do, do you guys have this problem? She sees it dark blue, I see it black. Does anyone have that problem? No? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gingy, for your honesty. Again, I don't know. I mean, you're always so honest. This has nothing to do with your eyesight. No, rather, it has everything to do with your internal spiritual human heart and human spirit. It has to do with what everyone can't see. It's your inner eye. Proverbs 20 verse 7 says this, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of the heart. Your eyesight is your human spirit and your human heart that has been developed through life's traumas or blessings. It's the learned behavior, how you've walked through life that has formed and shaped who you are that nobody else can see. This is not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is not your spirit. He comes alongside to teach your spirit, to train your spirit. This is your, this is your heart. This is your soil. For so, this, is, this, is, this is you. It's the human parts of you. It's the inner depths of the human heart. You know what this is? It's your moral compass. It's your conscience. It's how you treat people. It's what you do when no one's watching. It's your, hear this, emotional wellness. It's how you have stewarded your emotions. Are you emotionally healthy or sick? This isn't a church service. This isn't a new song. This isn't a conference. This is not merchandise. This is dealing with something that most of us never want to go through. Because it's that little thing inside me that if I don't get it healed, I've got envy. That if I don't let Jesus touch it, I walk with a corrupted scope and compass. And I filter everything through self. I don't trust. I keep bondage. I stay in bondage. It's that inner place where trauma gets in and hurt gets in and where your mother or father loved you or didn't love you. It's where abandonment was, where all of us have been emotionally hurt. And Jesus says, if your inner heart is good, everything's good. But if it's damaged and not dealt with, not healed, if you don't let my word get into the depths of you and choke some things out and remove some things, if you don't let me get into the depths of you, it doesn't matter how many times I lay hands on you, how many scriptures you confess, you'll always be tormented here. Always. You'll filter it like an outsider. You'll filter it through shame. You'll have a memory of what you've done. You'll never get forgiveness. You'll, you'll, you'll live under that bondage of the enemy. And emotionally, you're erratic. Wow. Something comes of trust and you lose it. How are you on the depths? How do you filter life? How are you in the depth, core of your being? It's your understanding. Are you sick or healthy? What do you do when you feel pressure? Do you run to a substance? What do you do? What's the status of your internal filter? When someone leaves you, do you get back into a rejection mode and it's rejection? When God blesses you, do you hoard it or do you steward it? When the enemy attacks you, how do we steward life's realness? Maybe you view the church all skewed now, huh? Maybe you view all the things that, that marriage is not good because it never works out. Or all. If we're not careful, we can view all of life's beauties. Through an evil, wicked interpretation. How's your inner eyes? My inner eyes, 
determine my outer steps. My inner eyes determine my outer steps. I want to be healthy in the core of my soul. I don't need to fight evil for evil. You're not my enemy. I don't need to take it into my hands. I'm not the vengeance. I don't need to do it. I don't need to force it. Why? Because I'm at rest. I'm healthy. I'm whole. And you know, Jesus comes as he always does. And then he just pushes something on our buttons and says, hey, how is the depth of your being? It's like Revelation chapter 3. It's the last church mentioned there. It's the Laodicean church. It's the church that's lukewarm. If you were to ask my humble opinion, this is the prophetic church of America. It's the greatest church. America is powerful. But God says, uh, I just wish you wouldn't lukewarm. Um, you, you're rich, but you don't buy of me, but you're really wretched. I wish you would come buy of me. You say you have need of nothing, but I say you're miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. And I think the church in America says, we got numbers, we got numbers, and God may say, but you have no spirit. We got a big budget, but you may not have breakthrough. And if we're not careful in America, we got, we got the house, we got the cars, I got the friends, I got the followers, but God may say, you're poor, you're wretched, you don't have fasting and praying, you don't have peace, you don't have breakthrough. And these guys thought, we have it all. Look at our numbers, numbers, numbers. We're doing great. We got the numbers. But we may not have. You know what the Bible says? God, Jesus is saying to them, he's saying, and I want to anoint your eyes that you may see. They were blind. And then that's where we get the famous verse, Revelation 3.20, where he's knocking on the heart to let him in. You know what Jesus is doing to his church? He's coming really close with great love and fervency, and it's all amazing, but he's going, will you let me in your heart? I know you love me, and I know it's good, but I'm knocking, I want the depth of you. I, I want to touch every part of you. And a lot of us, if we're not careful, we keep Jesus at arm's length. But he's saying, I want to come in, church. I want to dine with you. I want to touch you. I want to heal you. I want to set you free. And he's knocking where on my heart. He's knocking on the core of my being. And I just wonder, when Jesus comes knocking, different seasons, what's our response? Man, I gotta deal with that hate. I gotta deal with that insecurity. You know what, I gotta deal with this thing that's endeavoring to deal with me. In 1 Kings chapter three, I'm going to say this, what I would say by the Spirit. Here's where you know where your eye and perspective's at. If at a problem or a challenge, if you run from it, you're not healthy. But if you run to him and to it, you're healthy. Let me point it out. Goliath was taunting the nation, and Saul was poisoned and frozen. They wouldn't move forward. David ran to the problem. You know when you're healthy? When you run to a problem, not from it. You know, that's when you know where you're at on the inside. If you run from it, if you retract from it, wow. it's unhealthy. And a lot of us, if the truth be told, we run. We're runners. We run from God. We run from his prayer. We run from counseling. We run from accountability. We don't want to, we run from transparency, but we need to start running to Jesus, to brokenness. Come on, to, to, to honesty, running to the healer, running to him. Not from him. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, David's son's name is Solomon. And Solomon uh, encounters a, a dream, a vision where God says to Solomon at Gibeon, I'll give you whatever you ask for. C could you imagine if God said, I will give you Whatever you want, what would we ask? Solomon says, I could ask you for anything, but the one thing I ask you for is 
an understanding heart. You know what he says? I need you to do a work inside of me. Because if you don't work, do a work inside of me, I won't know how to lead. I won't know how to handle influence. Father, I need you to touch me in such a way. I need you to enlarge me. I need you to heal me. I need you to give me. I need a weight. I need you to touch the core of my being. Solomon asked for an understanding heart. God says he expanded like the sand of the seashore. And God says, because you asked this, I'll give you everything. You know what I've realized? If you'd let Jesus do the inner work, he'll always take care of the outer work. And you know, if we're not careful, all we're focused on doing the outer work. When I don't need to do the outer work, I just need to let him do the inner work. And if Jesus does the inner work, he'll do the outer work because he says, I'm in the secret. I'll see you in the secret. Come pray to me in the secret and I'll reward you in the open. And if we would just allow God to do the great inner work in us, it's amazing. Have you let the Holy Spirit do something on the inside of you in a powerful way? Oh, I'm saved. No, but has he transformed? Here's where we can live. Real small and in bondage internally. Or we can live real big and healed and whole and big on the inside. You know the best way to be on the inside is big. Won't you let God take your inner being and span it like the seashore? Big. Big to believe. Big for more friends. Big to let other people come in. Big. Lord, take my inner being and stretch it. I don't want to stay small. I want to live. I want to be a forgiver. I want to be internally healthy. I don't want to be prejudiced. I don't want to live with envy and jealousy. I, don't, I want to live celebrating. I'm not rivaling churches. I'm not rivaling. I want to celebrate pastors and celebrate with God. I don't want to critique. I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to be judgmental. I want to be a celebrator of what God is doing. And if not, we walk with God with a very skewed, small heart and spirit that keeps us in bondage. There was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted the church. He was a radical terrorist. Jesus finds him on the road to Damascus and knocks him down and blinds him. And um, he's blind for like three days and then he regains some sight. But Jesus tells him, Saul, I'm changing your name to Paul, but you'll be no good to me until you go to Ananias' house. And he prays for your eyesight and removes the scales from your eyes because I can't use you until you get a new perspective. And a lot of you have been Saul's and now you're Paul's, but you've got the same eyesight. You've been changed, you've been transformed, but you haven't allowed the, the scales. So you're still living like a sinner, or you're still acting like an outsider, or you haven't, you're still, you're not bearing fruit. But we know Jesus, and we've met him on Damascus, we know him, but we haven't changed how we see. And God, who's going to use Paul, to transform the church, Martin says, go to Ananias' house and he's going to pray for your eyes because scales got to fall off. Hurt has to come. Pain has to leave. You have to deal with those things. You have to deal with those wounds. You have to let Jesus touch because if not, you'll never be who I've called you to be. Has he touched the fabric of your being? Maybe you're riddled with fear. Can I tell you, you don't have to be riddled with anxiety and fear. There's more than I'm not, but I can tell you. One thing I am by the grace of God is free. I'm free. I'm free with who I am. Free with where I am. I love it. But there's nothing worse than following Jesus who's free and living in bondage. 
allowing you to be in a place of freedom. Are you spiritually awoke or asleep? Are you blind or can you see? Remember in 2 Kings chapter 6, the Syrians are attacking Elijah and Israel. And Elijah prays for servants because all he sees is the attack of the enemy. And he prays God open his eyes to see. And then he sees the angels and the chariots. See, you're fighting a battle, but until you have the right perspective, you think you've lost or you think it's over. But until you see, oh my gosh, this is propelling me and promoting me to where God's taking me. This, this is all working for our advantage. It's, it's not over. It's just begun. God's at work here and he's growing us here. And eyes to see all that's taking place around us. Typically when you're under attack, it's, it's your eye that's under attack. And my perspective needs to be permanently that do not be deceived, do not be deceived, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above. You do not be, God is good and he's the healer. You have to have a right perspective of who God is. Don't be deceived, God is good. And every good thing comes from him. Now as we end this morning, it's one of my favorite miracles of all. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is coming to to a blind man. I love this miracle because it's progressive. I love this miracle because most things Jesus does in our life is a process. It's not overnight. Salvation's overnight, but the rest of it is a journey. And so here's this blind man in, in Mark 8, and verse 22 says, he came to Bethsaida and he brought to them a blind person. And the man begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man and he led him, I love this, out of the town. Think about that. Jesus comes to him, the man's begging for his healing, and Jesus leads him first out of the situation. Because sometimes you need a different perspective, because in the situation you've lost your sight. And most of us are too close to it. We're too familiar with it. Because we're in the midst of what's not, that we can't see what is. So Jesus takes him out to show him what is. And sometimes you got to get out of your situation to see how good God has been to it. Sometimes you have to get out to see, to gain a different perspective. So Jesus leads him out. And then he spits on his eyes and puts his hand on him. And he asked him if he saw anything. And then he looked up and the man said, yeah, I see men like trees walking. confusion, blurriness, no clarity. You ever feel like you've been touched by Jesus, but it's incomplete, it's not over yet, but I still got a limp, Lord, and uh, I'm still struggling with this. Why, why, why is it incomplete? Because most things he does, it's progressive. Like, I, I can see a little bit, but I can't see fully, and I just still, I'm still there. Jesus says, well, what do you see? Well, I, I see men, I see trees, I, I'm confused, I don't see full clarity. But you know what I love that Jesus did? It says then he put his hand out and he touched his eyes again. He touched him again and he made him look up and he was restored and he saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house. I just wanna say today to me, to you, to our church. Jesus is not done touching you. He's not done healing. He's not, Jesus is still at work in your life. He's still, don't give up on your marriage. Don't stop now. He's still, even though it's not fully done, even though you haven't arrived yet, stay there. He's touching lives again. He's healing things. Will you let him touch you again? Will you let him visit you again? Will you let him heal you again? And so many times we come to church and we have a moment and it doesn't all get fixed that moment, but if we just stay in there and stay with him, little by little, he's leading us and he's working us and he's doing a work inside and outside and all around. Hang in and let him touch you again and let him heal you again and let him show himself strong to you again. Because a lot of miracles are partial miracles. You get just enough to hang on, but hang in there. Hang in there. 
keep staying persistent. Keep staying in faith. And I feel that so strong. He's not done touching your home. He's not done touching his church. He's not done touching his bride. He's still touching. He's still healing. He's still restoring. He's still moving. This is our God. This is our God. Because the truth be told, I've got a lot of partial things in my life. I got some here and some there, and it doesn't all add up. He didn't complete it all. It's not A to Z yet. There's some areas I don't understand, and there's some things that are still confusing. I can't see clearly, but hang in there because he's faithful. Why didn't he heal him the first time? To show you and I, it's a journey. I'm still working. I'm always working. Can I touch your marriage again? What if I restored that wedding kiss? Well, can I touch it again? Can I open your eyes again? And you say, Pastor, my eyes are so shot because I've got so much trauma. Won't you let him touch you? Won't you take your disappointment and bear? Won't you say, Lord, heal me from this. I'm tattered. I've got faith, but help my unbelief. I believe you, but I'm full of unbelief. If you can, I got faith, but I've got disappointment too. Just to be real, I fully believe you, but, but I've got some unbelief to touch me. I want to see clearly. i got to see clearly. Can't keep playing games, man. It's real. I live with it. I need. I want to be whole. I want to be whole. I want to have a good eye. You know what I've realized? When your perspective's right, your faith is right. When your perspective's positive, you're always encouraged. When you see it right, you have the strength to keep moving forward. When you see God right and the circumstance right, would you stand on your feet this morning for just a moment? When I came up to worship and I stood right here, I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered to my left ear and said, today, I've come for bondages, things you can't fix your own and even your therapist can't fix, but Jesus, I'm not saying don't have a therapist and don't get counseling, get counseling, get counseling. But today I feel like Jesus is here to reach, if it may be one or none, to reach some of the depths of you to set you free that internal place that deep place in Jesus you've touched me I'm a believer but I still have an incomplete work and I'm asking you to touch the depths of who I am would you just lift your hands today if you can just honestly say Jesus touch me again. Touch our church again. Touch our worship again. Touch me again. Touch us again. Touch. Touch. Touch my emotions. Touch my disappointments. Touch me. Touch me. My, my friend here, I, I don't know, you have a beard, you're strong, handsome, like a stew, like you stand out in the crowd. I don't know your name. I don't know if I know you. If I don't, I'm sorry. But you're like Samson in God. 
And the enemy for years has tried to pluck out your eyes and gouge out your eyes by the wrong thing called the spirit of Delilah. But today and this hour is completely different. In fact, God is restoring faith and vision and strength to you and you're like on an accelerated pathway. And God says, my kingdom is not complete without you because you are a man of honor and of army and of intellect and of strength. And you're a building block. You're a pillar. You just haven't had all the right opportunities. But all those opportunities aligned you for this moment. For Jesus. And soon your heart's going to burn. Because it was somebody else's faith. And somebody else brought you and brought you. But now it's your faith. And something's going to lock so powerfully in you. What's your name? What is it? Justin. Would you lift your hands to heaven, Justin? Father. <laughs> the things with your dad and all those things. Those internal things. You're going to be different. You've learned what not to do to know what to do. And God is giving you a new opportunity. It's a clean slate. It's unblemished, Justin. You start here, and you start now, and you start today. Today begins your new beginning. Jesus makes all things new, Justin. Here's, here's what I want to do as we leave this morning. I want to do today at home or here. I'll start. If you believe the Holy Spirit is here today to, to do some things in our lives and to touch some core areas to heal. Kainoa, no more crutches and no more victim, man. Your difference has changed. Let it go. Let the dead bury the dead. Pick up your mat and run, son. Pick it up. Don't go. Your mat's not your excuse. It's not your cover. up Your love for who you are and for what you are. It's not, that's not your persona. You're a son. You're a called son. Preach through life. Live life for the king of kings. Pick up your mat and come. Let's go. Walk in the fullness. But if you feel today like the Holy Spirit's here and you want God to do something, this is what I want us to do today. It's just kneel. It's humble ourselves under God's hand. And I know we, we have concrete, and I'm somewhat sorry for that in moments like these. But maybe sitting on your chair or getting in a, in a, in a position where we just say, Lord, we humble ourselves under your hand. So Lord, I need your touch again, but I'm going low. And if that's you today, would you just humble, humble ourselves under God's hand? Just 
take that place and posture. Just humble ourselves. Just again. He's healing from sexual abuse. I feel it so strongly. Sexual abuse, molestation, healing. Father's hurts and wounds and pains. voice and shout. That's it. When I lift my voice and shout place. Fresh. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I'm just saying there's a new place, a new realm of health and of internal healing. Jesus, heal your church, touch your church again and again and again and again and again. Would you join me up here, honey, please? Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand today and just express our love to the Lord? On your eyes, say every scale falls off. I have eyes to see, ears to hear. I got good eyes. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm made new. I see in the spirit. I'm awake. I'm alert. I'm discerning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's put our hands together and worship the King of all kings.